Hello? Okay. Is the screen up? Cool. Um, so this is, I'm Daniel and this is my talk about receiving live video from the ISS. I'm not going to make it too technical. If you want all the technical details, you can email me afterwards. I'll send you links and whatnot. I just wanted to show a lot of cool videos and then show you what you need to receive the video from the space station. So the first thing I'll do is show a little cool video. There's audio there, I don't know. I think it builds up. Hopefully there's audio. So this is sped up a bit, it's not actually real, real normal time. It gives you an idea of the view out the window. So um, part of that was to show um, some information about the ISS. So what is the ISS? I said I'd start a bit simple, but it's kind of important to what we're doing receiving video. So it's a, it's a joint enterprise between NASA, the Russians, Japan, Canada, and European Space Agency, of which the UK is a member at the moment anyway. Um, speed on orbit is 7.6 kilometers per second, or 27,600 kilometers per hour. It orbits at a height of around 400 kilometers, which is not actually that far away. So when it's directly above you, it's only 400 kilometers up or 300 miles up. So it's actually quite close to the Earth. The first section of it, the Russian section, section was launched in November 20, 1998. The end date um, of when they might just let it burn up in the atmosphere is slated as 2025, 2026, or 2026 maybe. So it's been there for about 16 years, 18 years. It's about another 10 years left, and it cost 150 billion US dollars. Great value for money. So as you saw, it moves around the Earth a lot. So the best site to, to figure out when it's going to be above you is heavens above. It's quite easy. Just put in your location, and it'll tell you what times it'll pass over. Uh, normally, it suggests when you will see it best. So you see it best when it's dark where you are and it's sunlight where the space station is. If you untick that option, it'll tell you about passes during daylight hours because with our system, it works during daylight hours and nighttime. So I'll show you my second video. If I can. So the ISS is the red dot. This is a sped up uh, idea. You can see it's going in a straight line. And the, the large circle is the area it can see on the ground, which is also the area you can receive video from. So you see it doesn't, every pass, it doesn't pass over the UK. 
but it does go around the world about every 94 minutes. And you'll see here it's passing over the UK a few times in a row. So um, we plan for that, we predict for that, and so here it's passing over the US quite a bit. You can see too, it never passes over the North Pole or the South Pole, so it never really goes too far north, probably never goes above Scotland anyway, and probably never goes below Australia. Um, I'm not sure why that is, but I'm sure there's uh, technical reasons. So um, when you see rockets launched, say from NASA, what it actually means is the rocket doesn't launch up, well it launches up initially, but it turns and it goes across. So they have to keep going at this speed. If they go too fast, they'll go out into space. If they go too slow, they'll, uh, their altitude will reduce and they'll burn up in, in the atmosphere, which the people on board wouldn't like. And I had a presentation somewhere. Anyway. Okay, so I'll talk now about ARIS. So ARIS is an abbreviation for Amateur Radio on the International Space Station. So what ARIS is, is a group of volunteers. Everyone who's involved as volunteers is people in NASA, people in the European Space Agency, mostly radio amateurs around the world, and some of them happen to work for some of the space agencies, which helps um, getting things done. So uh, I'll ask my special guest to, to do this on my behalf, if I can hide this somehow. There should be audio there. Hi everyone, I'm Tim Peake and welcome aboard the International Space Station. We're orbiting Earth 16 times every day. One of the most rewarding activities that some astronauts undertake on orbit is to talk to schools using the space station's ham radio. Now these are events that are planned by ARIS, which is a worldwide group of amateur radio volunteers who are dedicated to introducing young people and students to science, technology, engineering and mathematics. Now this is the equipment here in the Columbus Laboratory, which consists of a handheld radio, a headset and we also have a ham video unit. Now as the International Space Station orbits above your location, a radio link is established between the ISS and your school. Now, because we're traveling at nearly 18,000 miles per hour, which is an incredible 25 times the speed of sound, we usually get about nine or 10 minutes of good radio contact before losing the signal. So about five minutes before the scheduled start time of the contact, I come into the Columbus Laboratory and configure the radio so that I'm on the correct channel. And sometimes I'll set up the ham video too. Just before the predicted time, I begin to start calling the school using the standard amateur radio calling techniques. For example, if the call sign of your school was GB4 Fun, I would say Golf Bravo 4, Foxtrot Uniform November. This is Golf Bravo 1 Sierra Sierra, listening and standing by. Now at your school, the radio operator will be listening for my call, but may also transmit and try to call me as well you'll probably have a much more powerful transmitter on the ground than we have up here on board. So I'm likely to hear you before you hear me. Then, once we can hear each other, then comes the best bit, which is actually talking to the students and answering the questions. Once I've answered all the questions, we use the remaining time to say goodbye to each other and end the connection. I'll then spend a few minutes configuring the radio back into a rebroadcast mode and then I'll go back to my day job, which is of course, doing science on board the International Space Station. ARIS is a brilliant opportunity for astronauts to talk to school pupils. It's really rewarding to hear how excited the students are when they're talking to somebody up here in space. And it's a true privilege to be able to inspire our next generation of scientists and engineers through amateur radio. Okay, so you could see there, there's one little handheld radio. It's about the same size and power as the handheld radios they're using here for security. And it puts out um, a little bit of power and they use it to talk. So that was the system they had for about 15 years. They'd um, 
connect up the headset to the handheld radio and they'd uh, arrange in advance uh, to talk to school kids. And as usual, the school kids would ask them, how do I go to the toilet in space and the usual other questions. So lately, um, they've added this ham video downlinking. So as well as hearing the school kids, the school kids can see the astronaut live. So this is the box they have up on the space station right now, switched on, and it's broadcasting all the time. They only connect the camera to it now and then when they're doing school contacts, but in the meantime, it does broadcast um, a video out. So you can see there, there's the power switch on the left, uh, power for the camera and so on. And the little uh, metal loops beside the switches are designed so if an astronaut floats and crashes into it, he won't turn it off, so um, very high tech. Another interesting thing is there's green lights on it and orange lights on it, but we're not allowed any red lights because red lights in space mean something bad and death, danger to the astronauts. So we're not allowed to have any red lights unless it means they could die. So um, we didn't include any red lights. Um, so the first time I got involved in this, I heard they were doing this high-tech thing in space, and I said, oh, sure, I'll have a go at picking it up. And so I got a battered satellite dish. You can see it's actually battered. And it was so windy that day, it actually moved in my hand and bent a bit more. So a uh, rusty satellite dish. Uh, the actual bars uh, holding the feed there are just treaded bars. So we drilled a few holes in the dish. And uh, the thing at the, the point in the dish is like a plastic water pipe. So a bit of a DIY job. So I just did this for the crack. Went up to a mountaintop I thought, on the day and the time they were going to test it. And I picked up uh, live video during the tests. So I sent a, a recording of the live video to the guys in Europe who were mostly doing it. And they said, God, you're the first guy not on the main team that's picked up the video. Would you like to run a station in Ireland? And so they sent me a full kit of equipment paid for by the European Space Agency. And I found a site to locate it. And so this is the equipment we have now. So this is located in Cork in the south of Ireland. It's about a three hour drive from my house, which uh, is, is great when it breaks. It takes me three hours to get down, three hours to get home. So there's a motor at the bottom, which turns the dish uh, left to right. And there's a motor at the top, which turns the dish up and down. You can see there at the top right of the dish, there's a counterweight, which are actually uh, dumbbell weights. And we adjusted them to make sure the dish was uh, balanced right. And uh, there's a friend of mine who was helping me. So this is uh, automatically points at the space station. It automatically turns automatically move down, and remotely I can, I can connect to the computer and start the tracking whenever I want. So this is the, the basic software. So the software is free and open source. The standard is quite standard. It's DVBS, which is the same standard used for satellite TV. So to test the system, we can just hook it into an ordinary satellite dish and watch normal TV. I used to use Sky News for testing. Some of the European stations use Bloomberg TV for testing. And the main idea is to point at the space station and get all the green lights across the bottom. All the green lights means the signal's fine and you've got a good video downlink. Up there at the top, as and L show the direction the dish is pointing. So if it's, uh, if it's not changing, it means you're not tracking. So that software is called ChuTune, uh, T-U-T-I-O-U-N-E. And then the best hardware to connect to, to it is called MiniTuner, which is a kit. So it's basically a satellite receiver kit and it it's works the best. So ideally, you need a dish and a feed. That makes the signal stronger. Ideally, you need rotators and a rotator controller. Ideally, you use software that gets the position of where the space station is. So we use Orbitron, and we ask NASA um, where the space station is going to be. And that little file is called a TLE. We then send the video that we receive to wherever the school might happen to be. So it might be in the UK, it might be in France, it might be in Germany. And we receive it in Cork, and we send it uh, through the internet streams. There's also sister stations in France, in Italy, in Portugal, and in Poland. And as we lose the signal in Ireland, they take over with the streaming. If you can't afford all that, you can do a bit like I did at the start. The same frequency is, is used is the same frequency as Wi-Fi. So any Wi-Fi antenna will work. Obviously, the bigger it is, the better. Um, two, if you wait for the space station to be directly above you, the signal is like 10,000 times stronger, so you're much more likely to get something. Um, if you can't afford an expensive preamplifier, you can get one from China. Um, you can make the kit yourself, and then just handheld tracking. So you can actually get apps for your phone, you can get software for your PC that will tell you where the space station is going to be and when, and you can just literally move the dish using your hand. 
So this gives you an idea of kind of the setup. So each of the sites in Europe um, have a, their own little TV screen and they stream whenever they get video. And normally Cork or Portugal is the first to get it. And then we hand over to France and then to Italy and then to Poland. And hopefully we'll get 10 or 11 minutes of constant video. So I'll show you my next little video. Uh, this video is a combination of um, all the different videos from the different schools and also... What's up? Um, this is John Breyer, KG4AKV, oh, and I just want to... And um, we edited them together just to give a cooler video. So at the start, there's no video, and then as the space station gets a bit closer, we get video. So at the start, it's audio only. Hi, are you ready for your first question? Over. It's great to be talking to you in Norwich, and yes, I'm ready for my first question. Over. Hi, this is Maddie. What do you do if you cut yourself really badly in space? Over. Hi, Maddie. Good question. We do actually use something to design sometimes up here, so we do have to be careful. If we get a really bad cut, then we could actually give ourselves some local anaesthetic and stitch it up uh, with the help of some doctors back in uh, ground control if we need to. Over. Hi, this is Austin. Are there any protocols or guidance in place if George Clooney comes knocking on the front door as he did in the film Gravity? Over. Hi Austin, well as far as I'm aware we're the only six human beings in space up here so if anybody comes knocking on our hatch I'm not opening it. Over. Tim, it's Kieran M0XTD. We have you on Ham TV. Give us a wave. Here's your next question. Hi, this is Sophie. What experiment would you like to add to your mission based on the experiences you have had? Over. Hi, Sophie. Um, I would like to see us doing more of the medical research, um, you know, investigating some more vaccines and looking into uh, new drug methods as well. I think that's some of the most exciting research we're doing up here. Over. Hi, this is Max. In what ways does the lack of natural sunlight and fresh air affect you on the ISS? Over. Hi Max, I love opening the windows in the cupola when I'm in uh, Node 3 or in the uh, Japanese module. I love the sunshine coming through the windows and it does make a difference. It does kind of brighten up your day and make you feel better. And you just get used to the fact that we see so many day and night cycles. Over. Hi, this is Charlotte. How do you get changed in space when your clothes go everywhere? Over. Hi Charlotte, they do go everywhere. We have to use bungees. Uh, we bungee our clothes down so they don't float off and you don't lose them. Over. Hi, this is Eden. One of the experiments you are conducting in space is to measure fluid shifts in the body. In what way does this help us back on Earth? Over. Hi Eden, that's a great question. Fluid shift really kicks off the whole process of the changes to our body. It's because of the fluid shift we get greater pressure in our head and we start to lose uh, bone density as well. So that triggers all the changes and it's by changing things in our body that we can learn about our body and we can investigate these things. Over. Hi, this is Thomas. With the basic design of the current spacecraft dating back decades, where do you think the next leap forward in spacecraft technology will occur? Over. Hi Thomas, yes, I mean we're playing with basic rules of physics and gravity here and laws of motion so um, I think that we're going to see big changes to our spacecraft in terms of our transit to Mars and transit to Moon uh, but in terms of getting to low Earth orbit I don't think we're going to see many big changes that, that we have in current spacecraft design, over. Hi, this is Emily. How different was the, was the training compared to the experience of actually launching into space? Over. I believe the training was so good that it really prepared us for launching into space and there are very few differences between what we were training for on ground and how we live and work up here in space. Over. Hi, this is Millie. With improving technology on Earth, are there experiments that you are currently carrying out in space that could one day be repeated on Earth? Over. 
Yes, there are loads of uh, experiments up here that we're doing that could be repeated uh, on Earth. I think that it's going to be a long time before we um, manage to sort of counter gravity for a long period of time on Earth. So we use parabolic flights and drop towers. But the benefit of being up here in low Earth orbit is, of course, we have microgravity continuously. So we can do those experiments for a very long time. Uh, but we do repeat the experiments back on Earth, of course, to see the changes, to see what's difference between space and Earth. Over. Hi, this is Erin. Which materials being developed with the electromagnetic levitator will have the largest impact on the development of greener living? Over. Hi, Erin. Well, I think the metal alloys are the one area of research that are going to have the big impact on greener living uh, because that will affect how our engines are designed um, and uh, in particular our commercial aircraft turbine blades and turbine engines, for example, which will cut down fuel production and cut down fuel usage and uh, have a good impact in, in aviation. Over. Hi, this is Maddie asking Lola's question. Since being in space, what has been your most amusing dream? Over. Hi, Maddie. Do you know, I, I haven't dreamt much up here in space. Uh, and when I do, I dream of Earth. I haven't yet dreamt of being in space. Um, and I think it's because we, we sleep quite heavily up here, actually. I, quite, I sleep quite well here in space. Over. Hi, this is Austin asking Libby's question. If everyone in Britain turned their lights on and off at the same time, would you see it from space? Over. Hi, Austin. Yes, you definitely would see it. You know, we would see a, a small village if you turned your lights on and off. It's amazing that um, we, the lights really stand out very well from space. Um, and certainly a, a major city turning their lights on and off would stand out very clearly. Over. Hi, this is Sophie asking Ella's question. Which part of the Earth do you like orbiting over the most and why? Over. Hi Sophie, uh, I love orbiting over Africa, it just looks beautiful from space, it's like flying over a, a canvas of art um, and also North, northern Canada is beautiful, especially right now with all the ice and the, uh, even the sea is frozen up there, over. Hi, this is Max asking Amy's question, with sunrise and sunset occurring 16 times a day on board the ISS, does it have any noticeable effect on your body clock, over. Hi, Max. That's a great question. Yes, it does. You know, if, I, if I'm looking in the cupola late at night when it's bright sunshine, it does take me a while to get to sleep. Uh, so I try not to do that. You have to kind of try and trick your body that it's nighttime when it's time to go to sleep. Over. Hi, this is Charlotte asking Mimi's question. How does being in space make you relate to your place in the universe? Over. Hi Charlotte, that's a great question. You know, I mean, being up in space gives a different perspective and it makes you realize how vast the solar system is, how vast the universe is. And also it makes you realize that our planet, uh, you know, it has no borders. It's got massive weather systems that uh, are affect all continents. And so it does give you that perspective of, of the planet as a whole, over. Hi, this is Eden asking Bruno's question. Is there a song or a piece of art that you think reproduces the feeling of being in zero gravity? If so, which one? Over. Hi, Eden. Well, I, as nothing particular comes to mind, but you know some of those pictures where things look uh, different upside down. For example, it might be a beautiful woman one way up and a, an old haggard woman the other way up. I think that's great because it, it makes you realize in space, of course, we have a different perspective depending on which way up we are. Over. GB2CNS returning. That was fantastic, thank you. Everyone here would like to say a big thank you. Okay, so you get the idea there. Um, there's been about 10 or 12 UK schools this year got to speak to the space station. Uh, the main reason so, there were so many is they were given priority um, because there was a British astronaut on board. Uh, next year there will be a French astronaut on board and so um, they're trying to prioritise French schools. I think they have 15 French schools listed and so they're hoping uh, 15 French schools will get to talk to the space station. But again, uh, from Ireland I'll be helping with the video and um, we'll be sending it over. So hopefully if it's a French school uh, we should have video about the same time as we have audio. And I'll see if I can get my slides to move. Maybe not. Uh, there we go.
Okay, so this is just my final slide here. So um, there's a number of websites. If you want more detailed information, you can send me an email. Um, so Viva DATV is where the software we use is. It's also information about the mini tuner. ARIS is the international group that organized school contacts, and there's an EU version of it. Um, then the AMSAT UK is based in the UK, and, and they have lots of information, and they actually helped organize all the UK school contacts. And they have loads of videos there on the YouTube link. Basically, AMSAT UK on YouTube, they have lots of videos. And they have videos, too, about uh, the equipment they used in the UK. And they have a uh, recording of all, of all the school contacts. Um, I don't think I have time for questions, but um, I'll take questions outside afterwards. Thank you.